Uh, it's wonderful to have all of you here. I must say it's, uh, it's also uh, quite nice um, because many of you are friends, are colleagues, co-authors, um, and so this is a shared project and I'm reporting basically back on what we've done, done together and many of you also are students and hopefully that we'll do together in the future. So, uh, uh, I'm going to say something about the data revolution in South African history today, a broad topic. Um, and uh, I think the best way to do this is to start with kind of my own the first steps into this direction. And that is uh, my own PhD, uh, which was on the Cape, uh, the wealth of the Cape settler, um, the 18th century settler. Um, it's not that I always knew that I wanted to be an economic historian or um, that I uh, had planned this for a long time. Uh, it's very coincidental in the way that it happened. But I have been reading a lot of South African history, specifically for a project that I was working with um, uh, with a colleague, uh, Werner Bosso, uh, about ships in the Cape Colony. And the more I read uh, about the kind of Cape history, 18th century Cape his uh, history, the more very clear message emerged. And that was that this was a very poor place. The Cape Colony, Dutch uh, East India Company, who had settled the Cape uh, in the 17th century, um, and established a, a refreshing station and over time, over about 140 years, this had developed into a colony uh, with three settlers uh, living where we are in Stellenbosch and into the interior. But the, kind of, the message was uh, from the historiography that this was more of a static than a progressing community, a social and economic backwater, a slave-based subsistence economy that advanced with almost extreme slowness. And this message kind of persists. So we see even today uh, a recent book by Jen Davenport uh, saying South Africa, this is before the mineral revolution in the 19th century, South Africa was a sleepy colonial backwater whose unpromising landscape was seemingly devoid of any economic potential. Right, so this is the kind of clear message. And, and as, a, as kind of an economist at this stage, I thought, well, clearly this must be backed up by evidence, uh, by statistical evidence. And yet, in a, in a in a kind of monograph I found by Peter van Dijk and Rob Cross in 1987, they kind of have this throwaway line saying the backwardness of the colony at the end of the 18th century has yet to, be, yet to be fully challenged or indeed fully investigated. And this is exactly what a student wants, right? Is to, to be able to say, well, it seems to, it, it seems at least in literature that there is one uniform message, this was a poor place, but in fact, um, there's no actual evidence, um, at least the evidence that is provided is mostly kind of anecdotal and that's always um, something worth investigating. And this kind of historical fact of the, of the Cape as being a poor place became kind of a myth from two kind of strands of the literature in the, in the 20th century uh, historiography. So the kind of Afrikaner nationalist historians um, represented here by from Jaas Felsberg um, had the idea, well, kind of this idea of a poor place evolved into also poor ideologically and, uh, and uh, also partly to do with the fact that these um, Afrikaners didn't have, or, um, ooh, uh, not now, uh, that these Afrikaners didn't have like one identity, and it's only in the 20th century that some kind of uniform identity is, is created. Um, so it kind of fitted the, the, the story also partly of a poor, backward uh, people that is in the 20th century, pulls themselves up by the bootstraps, right? That kind of narrative. On the other side, kind of English liberal historians, uh, here um, uh, represented by Alistair Sparks, also had this idea that this kind of fitted the narrative perfectly for them, because they would say this, the mind of Africana was shaped during six generations, they were lost in Africa. Um, I'm not going to read the entire book, but Basically, this was a poor people, a people who became surely the simplest and most backward fragment of Western civilization in modern times. Right? So basically, the, these Afrikaners were poor and backward, and they were stuck in Africa, and uh, that's kind of, that explains the racist policies that they had in the 20th century. So that's kind of the narrative. So both, both of these schools of thought almost used the backwardness of the Cape Colony as a way to justify um, their theories in the, in the 20th century. And so this is some partly something that I wanted to investigate. And what I did is to use, I was lucky to start this project just after a massive transcription project that started at UCT and UWC, where probate inventories were uh, fully transcribed. Um, probates are lists of assets when people die. 
And so I, I used two and a half thousand of these probate inventories that were available in PDF. And um, to kind of summarize it very shortly, for my PhD, I counted cheap. I had to count a lot, uh, lots of different kinds of, of um, uh, products, household commodities. Uh, these are 28 of the products that I looked at um, and that I reported in, in this 2013 paper. And what struck me immediately, I mean, you won't be able to see all the kind of, uh, small numbers here, but what struck me immediately but was the, the wealth, the average wealth of these settlers. So there was a lot of anecdotes, and clearly there were a lot of poor settlers as well. I'm not dismissing the fact that, they, that poverty exists. But on average, the average settler owned, uh, for example, five paintings. Uh, right, so we would think today someone that owns five paintings, even today, in today's standards, that's not a necessarily utter poverty. But back then, this is massive, right? And especially if you can start comparing these um, these numbers to settlers, for example, in the United States, the settlers <coughs> okay, were far more affluent than what we certainly expected they would. Uh, that certainly, that the historiography suggested that they were. Um, and you can count. I looked at different kinds of uh, commodities like cattle and horses, uh, productive assets, household assets, uh, necessities, these kind of things. And all of them, the numbers seem to suggest, seem to tell the same story. And then the kind of question emerges, obviously from a, from a statistical perspective, is this representative? Are probates a good reflection of society? Aren't we just capturing the rich people? Um, and so the best way to prove that, I think, is to find a completely different source that kind of corroborate these these source, uh, the, the progress. And uh, luckily I was, I could find such a source, and that was the inventories, uh, the, sorry, the Opkafo, the, the tax censuses, which I then could, can compare to the, to the uh, could compare to the inventories. And I, I just want to kind of, there's a lot of numbers again here, I just want to show you two here. So these two uh, um, tables here at the bottom, um, exclude all the zeros, so they, they make it much more comparable because the people that would be included in the probates are slightly different than the people that would be included in the inventories. And then if you look at the number of slaves, individual slaves that these settlers own, you would see that from completely different um, uh, populations, basically, or from completely different samples, you would see that these averages are almost identical, 7.42 and 7.49 for the average number of slaves, right? Remarkably so, even if you look at the rest of the distribution, they look very similar. So that kind of seems to, to suggest that at least these two, these two sources, which are created by completely different data generating processes, does yield the same results. But actually, if you then compare the number of cattle, where you've got in the uh, private inventories 94 heads of cattle, versus 54 um, in the in, uh, in the uh, or in the in the tax censuses, you see that there are massive differences. So this kind of is quite striking, and also you see the same if you look at horses and sheep. So why would that be? Why would the number of slaves be similar, but not other types of commodities? It's because these other types of commodities were taxed, right? So the tax censuses, and so massive underreporting of. Um, of, of uh, commodities there in the specifically in the opera world. Um, I when I presented this number here, 54 on average number of cattle to my supervisor uh, in Holland, he just said, um, I think he was a bit uh, uh, stunned because he just said this must be wrong, this this cannot be right. The rich, the richest households in Holland at that time owned on average 25 head of cattle. You were considered very rich if you had 25 head of cattle. On average, we find the settlers at 54, right? So clearly, I mean, these cattle are not the same. There are many different other types of kind of environmental differences. But still, to say that this is an economically backward society is problematic. This was one example, obviously, how I started. But there are many of these kinds of questions that we, that we can answer with what I would call the data revolution. And I, I want to kind of classify it into two types of studies that have been done. Uh, most of my work is actually just on using very uh, simple uh, descriptive statistics. And these can be applied to many different fields, not only in economic history, 
but in social history, there's a lot of work to be done in demographic history, migration, labor, political history, historical geography, a lot of different fields that can benefit from this. And unfortunately, as I'll say a bit later, I feel like in South Africa at least, this has not been done yet, and there's a lot of scope to do this. <coughs> a second strand, which is mostly done by economists, is to um, try and find more causal answers or causal interpretations using econometric tools. Um, I've done a little bit of this, mostly with some of my colleagues in the economics department, but there's also an immense uh, opportunity here um, in South Africa to do more of this type of, of, of work. And maybe I'll just explain very briefly what I mean with causal interpretation using econometric techniques, and the way I'll do that is to use probably the most famous paper on African economic history that was written in the last two decades, uh, Nathan Nunn's paper on slavery. So my students are smiling because they've seen this many times before. But um, what we see here is the negative correlation between the income per capita, so how affluent the country is today, in 2000, in the year 2000, um, correlated with the number of slaves that were exported from those countries, right? And slave, the slave trade obviously was, what is this, 400, 500 years um, ago, so this is a long time span that we're talking about. Um, and so, so Nathan Nunn basically counted the number of slaves per region or per country that were exported and finds this kind of negative correlation. So what Nathan wants to do is to say it's the slavery that causes lower levels of development. But you can't just do that with a correlation. The reason is that there might be other things that might be both causing the number of slaves that leave uh, the country that, that are exported. So say it's, for example, a poor country already. Um, so maybe perhaps in poor countries you see more slaves being exported and that poverty persists still today. So it's not, not, it's not because it was the slaves that were exported that causes the lower levels of development. It was for other reasons that these countries were poor. Maybe they had a lot of malaria or other types of environmental disadvantages and therefore we see this negative correlation. What we want is a causal link. And so what Nathan's paper did so well was to come up with an instrument, right? An instrument um, is something that is correlated to the slavery and then also to the uh, incomes today, but for no other reason except for the fact that it goes through the slavery. So let me, let me give you an example of what Nathan did. Nathan said, um, let's look at the distance between the slave markets in Africa and the slave markets in uh, the Americas. Right? So this is um, the slaves were shipped from Africa all the way to the Americas and presumably the closer the distance between these markets the more slaves would be shipped. Right? Transportation costs are lower so you would see greater density of slave, uh, um, slave shipments. So if the distance to America from the slave ports is correlated, should be correlated to the number of slaves that leave the countries in Africa, right? So the closer the distance, the more slaves would leave. That makes sense? So there's a negative correlation. And if, the, if that um, distance is then also correlated to incomes today, it can be only through the link of slavery. Right? There's no other reason today that the distance between Africa and America should matter to incomes. Right? There's no reason that you would expect countries that are closer to the Americas would be richer or poorer. There's no theoretical reason for that. So the only reason that the distance today will affect incomes today is because it affected the slave trade. Right? That's basically the idea. So if you can find this kind of statistically, you can find this kind of correlation which is done here. I'm not going to um, go into this. Um, but then basically if you look at the First stage regression, you'll find that the closer the distance, the more slaves leave, and then secondly, in the second stage, the closer the distance, the, greatest, the greater the impact on incomes today. So this negative correlation. So Nathan Nunn's story basically saying slavery causally affects uh, incomes today, African development today. Right? So that's an, an example of a causal interpretation. And as I said, there are many different um, uh, 
possible hypotheses that you can test in South Africa with these types of, of analyses. That's not what I'm going to focus on today. I'll, I'll um, mention perhaps one of them. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on, on descriptors. Okay. Maybe just a very brief history of the data revolution. So, um, using data is not a new thing. It's not, certainly it didn't start with me. Um, hopefully it won't end also uh, with me, but it's, it's, it goes back to the 1950s and 1960s. Right? Um, the slave trade is one example of where data was already employed uh, heavily um, in understanding um, the size and the nature of the slave trade. Um, and without kind of spending too much time on this, basically by the 1980s, economics and history uh, diverge. Right? So economic history basically uh, implodes. On the one side, there's various reasons for this. The one is simply that African economies are struggling, so resources that would typically go to universities uh, that would investigate economic history decline, and so you see less interest on the continent. Also, the continent is not performing very well, so there's less interest in explaining um, growth, uh, for example. But I think the two major kind of explanations are that firstly economics kind of moved into a more um, mathematical direction. So with the geometric revolution in the, in the 1970s, it becomes very technical. Um, and history diverged, kind of given the postmodernist uh, movement or uh, shifts, it becomes more cultural. It's a kind of cultural turn in history. Um, and so these two fields just simply don't talk to one another again. Um, obviously, that's maybe a simplification. There's still a very good economic history papers that are published, but far fewer and far fewer conferences, for example, than, than in the past. And it's only really since 2000 that we see this kind of renaissance, it's been called, of African economic history. And there are a lot of interest, and again, kind of linking to the rise of African um, uh, countries in terms of the kind of um, economic growth. So a lot more interest in trying to understand what is the, at the, kind of the roots of this, of this new growth um, phase. But there's a lot of other kind of also um, kind of complementary reasons, and there's a lot of topics that's been that's been investigated. Again, slavery is always on the agenda, but then a lot more work on missionaries, um, on institutions, railways, climate. It's kind of linked also to the fact that economists now have a better toolkit, econom econometric toolkit, they have stronger processing power, and so we can actually analyze a lot of um, questions that were typically very expensive time-consuming to analyze. Most of this literature, um, these kind of topics that I've mentioned, are done by economists. So this renaissance is almost entirely, well not entirely, but it's, it's largely the result of economists spending more time understanding um, kind of the links between the past and the present. That's typically what, what, why economists are interested in this. Um, a colleague of mine in, in, Sassi, uh, in, in Warwick would say, uh, we study economic history because the past explains the present, but also the past is analogous to the present. And so that's typically why economists are interested in the past. But these are kind of a different school. Um, these are two are not completely separate, they overlap. Um, but I would classify these as, as economic historians, and I think I would find myself more in this group, which believes that there's a different approach like these these uh, studies at the top typically rely on very accessible data. Uh, the similar, the same uh, colleague that I've mentioned is very proud of the fact that he can write African economic history papers while in, while he's in Starbucks and just download all the data that he needs. I think there's a different, slightly different approach uh, to doing that, and that is actually entering archives and transcribing, digitizing and transcribing uh, primary source material. Because there's a wealth of this type of material available that's never really been, well not never, but that's hardly been looked at. And these include genealogies, so marriage, birth records, tax censuses, voters will, attestation forms, um, and a lot of different other things. Kind of novel uses almost of existing material that historians might have used in the past, but that haven't been used in the way that, that economic historians are now using that. And so what basically, I mean, this is a very long introduction, but basically the point of this, um, of this presentation is just to show you some of the examples that we've used um, where, where this data has been used. 
Um, I'm going to cover uh, kind of a wide swath of, of South African history and, and different topics, but it will give you a sense of what we do and also hopefully of, of what can still be done. Um, so with Dieter, who's, who's here, um, uh, I worked um, on the effect or the impact of the Huguenots and their productivity on, um, on kind of uh, cake production. And what we did is basically we split the settlers at the Cape into three groups, those from those Huguenots from wine producing regions, those from non wine producing regions, and then the other, type, other settlers, so typically Dutch and German settlers. And we just kind of look at what, they, what happens to their productivity over time using the tax census, so using the old coffee. And what you kind of, kind of see is this, this divergence, right? So you actually see initially you see the kind of similar levels of productivity, so productivity in terms of wine making. And then over time you see the Cape Huguenots you know, just becoming far more, um, more productive. Um, so given basically the same number of vines, they just produce more wine and better quality wine. And we have a, a, a long story about why that is and how that is. But basically it boils down to the fact that they've got skills. They know how to do this and they protect those skills within the household. And we've got some evidence to support that. Uh, with a colleague in Germany, in Tübingen, with Barton, uh, we used um, court records where the ages of different groups in the Cape Society were reported. So if you go to the court, then you must report your age. And age can actually tell you a lot about a person, not only obviously how old it is, but it can also tell you something about numeracy, about that person's ability to actually report their age. And if you calculate numeracy using kind of aging techniques, then you can differentiate the different ethnic groups at the Cape. So you've got the European settlers, but then you've also got different uh, other types of ethnicities, mostly from the Indian Ocean. And you can kind of classify the different levels of numeracy that, that they had, and then changes over time. Right. Uh, with, uh, so as I said, this is going to be very, very quick. Um, but with Eric Green, I am, uh, I've worked on just actually enumerate, enumerating the, the Kwesa. Right, so actually, it's really difficult to find accurate numbers for the Khoisan in, uh, in the Cape, simply because they're not reported in the other sources of statistical evidence that we have. So slaves, for example, settlers are very well reported and enumerated, but not so much the Khoi. And we've, what we've did is to <coughs> combine the, the um, Opgraf order, the tax censuses, with actual journal reports of someone, Adam Das, for example, saying, I've, today I've employed 50 Khoisan laborers on my farm. And if you kind of merge these two over a century, you can kind of calculate a better measure of, of Khoisan. There's now a scholar at the Y who's, who's just published a new paper, improving again on our measure. And this, is, this matters, it's not only about counting it, because the, what we often, these uh, indigenous laborers or farm laborers is often being kind of neglected when you do estimates of productivity um, or estimates of GDP per capita. And when you do include them, these numbers change. Right? So that kind of changes the, the interpretation of this global economy. Uh, with then a master student, Christy Swanepoel, I looked at missionaries. So uh, here we've got all the mission stations that we have. There's a wonderful um, 1849, uh, 1849 mission station census um, where you can calculate literacy and again numeracy and these kind of things and then we ask uh, what is the persistence of this educational attainment in the mission stations on education today is there like a persistent effect so there's a big literature in the field showing that um, mission stations have this persistent uh, effect in Africa um, typically uh, where the studies are done. And so we wanted to see whether this also is true in the Cape. And when we do that, we do actually find this persistent effect. But then we also complicate it slightly by saying it's probably not only because of education, but also because of selection into the mission stations. So once you control for migration, these effects not only they disappear um, almost entirely. So it kind of um, does raise some questions about the way we measure the effects, these persistence effects. And I should perhaps say here that one of the concerns of historians, and I think it's a very valid concern, is that economists often just what they call compress history. So we would have one shock 500 years ago, like the slave paper, 
and then another measure today, and then regardless of what happens in between, we kind of see a, sh a, a net effect or a persistence effect. Um, and I think it's very important to think very carefully about um, not only, I think, like two uh, points of observation, also, again, because the data generated process is, is very different. We need to think very carefully about how we uh, investigate these uh, persistent shocks. Um, uh, sorry, these slides are from Afrikaans. This was a paper published uh, on the uh, Angabu war concentration camps. So, Elizabeth von Heinemann was wonderful in giving us her what must have been a several year long exercise in transcribing um, uh, concentration camp information, more than 100,000 individuals. Um, and so what we basically do is build a, a population pyramid on the left hand side, you'll see the different ages, so from 0 to 4, from 5 to 9, etc. On the, the right hand side you've got women, left hand side you've got men, and what you see is this is just a breakdown of people uh, that were in the camps. Um, and we often think, of, well at least the kind of um, historiography that we read seems to really emphasize the fact that it was only women and um, and, uh, and uh, children in the concentration camps. There's actually, we find a lot of evidence of, well, there's certainly more men in the concentration camps than women, um, but there's also a lot of middle aged and old aged men. So it's not only boys um, that you find, um, which I think is interesting. On the right hand side, we've done a survival analysis of just who, who remained in the camps the longest. And surprisingly to us at least, it wasn't people, it wasn't those born in the Transvaal or those born in the Free State, it was actually those born in the Cape Colony that stayed in the camps the longest. Um, and our interpretation is that, that was, it was almost that they were made an example. So that there wasn't more support from the Cape Colony of the Columbus. Um, so this paper is in the place of the Um, you can to read that. With a colleague in Barcelona, Alfonso, I um, calculate the impact of the railways. Um, basically, the construction of the railways from the uh, 1870s onwards, and um, find that there's this immense, immense um, shock, a positive shock of the railways. So it contributes um, it, uh, up to 25% of, of labor productivity. I mean, this is kind of. It's not that surprising in a sense that the, the historiography also suggested that the railways had this massive impact, but we quantified for the first time um, both the freight and the passenger um, benefits. Um, and I think lastly for, for, for this series, uh, Christy was then a PhD student after that. She did a master's and she looked at the credit markets in the Cape Colony. And so the probates that I used, I didn't touch on the credit records in them, and she then focused on the credit markets. And there's this kind of long, again, the, this is mostly based on what people at the time had written about the credit market. So they complained and said the credit markets are making people poor and everyone is in debt. And, um, and it's especially the, the poorest of the poor that are suffering most from the credit. And they have the most credit also. And so when you analyze actually these transactions, it turns out to be very different. It seems to be that the credit is almost always used as an investment instrument. It's mostly the rich, so those would be testified, those sectors with more than 25 slaves, they have large debt records that they owe to other people, and they use this, the debt that they incur for investment purposes. They are, they are, so it's a, it's, it kind of completely reverses the argument that debt is some kind of um, evil, uh, which seems to be often um, what's, what's kind of most uh, historians at least have written about. Uh, and instead, and certainly people at the time, obviously there were people that defaulted, and so they would be angry about or, um, you know, the, the debt that they had incurred. But what we find is, on, in, on average, again, you see that debt is actually a, a useful tool for economic expansion. Okay. Um, and then uh, you'll see that a lot of this stuff has been on the 18th and 19th century uh, with my colleague Okan. We then said, well, we also want to do something on the 20th century. And one of the things about the 20th century is that we actually have very little information along where there's a long series available for black South Africans. Like we, we simply don't have one consistent series, for example, on wages, which is typically what you would want to kind of measure 
uh, living standards over time. And so we needed to find a very different approach. And in, within econo uh, economic history, there's a big field called, uh, called anthropometric history. And anthropometrics uses the height of individuals over time to measure living standards. Um, and it might sound more controversial than it really is. It's a very old field since the 1980s already. People have used this uh, for many different uh, countries and, and population groups. To put it very, um, uh, kind of, uh, give you a very easy example to understand, in the 1950s, South and North Koreans were of equal height. Uh, today, South Koreans is about 8 centimeters taller than North Koreans. So that's a very good indication. Genetically, they are exactly the same, but height can actually be a very good indication of, of prosperity. Um, so what we do is we can we will look, we will use heights of black South Africans over time to kind of look at the changes over, um, in living standards over time. Again, perhaps something useful to add. So obviously, for an individual, uh, your genetics matter. So uh, it explains about eighty percent of your height. But about 20% of your height is explained by the environment. And over a 100 year period, genetics doesn't change. So if you see changes in height, it must be because of changes in the environment. So we use four sources um, on heights. Um, some of them more, I think, plausible in terms of um, you know, biases than others. So we use NITS and the DHS, so that's fine. But we also use, to go back in time, we need to use other types of sources. So here we have um, uh, the recruits to the Second World War. And these, um, so black male recruits, they are not non-combatants, so there shouldn't be selection on height in that sense. Um, on the right hand side here, we have um, cadavers in a vet's archive. So this covers a, a longer period of time. Um, uh, and you might have questions about uh, so cadavers, unclaimed cadavers, so potentially they would be from poorest, poorer parts of the population. We actually find that their heights are typically taller than, than, than for example, the DHS. So, it, so it's not, it goes counter to what we would expect um, the selection should be. But nevertheless, there are, there are some questions about selection. If we do have a combine all of them, we get a graph that looks like this. Right, so a decline in the first 30 years of the 20th century in terms of black living standards. So this is the date of, uh, of birth. Your height is basically determined by the first 10 years of your life. So if you get a lot of good nutrition, you tend to grow taller. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's, it's generally true. Um, uh, so, so the first two years really matters um, in terms of height. So we see a decline. People born in 1920 are, are shorter than people born in 1910. Right? So that's the way to interpret this. Then you see this kind of uh, more surprising, a bit strong increase, and then you see a flattening off. I'm more than happy to kind of accept the fact that this is probably not as steep. It's probably going more flatter like that. But the interpretation is still the same. By the 1930s, when South Africa leaves the gold standard, mining increases significantly. Uh, mines offer jobs to black South Africans incomes increase. We have other evidence from the 1970s that this is likely the story. In 1974, there's a plane crash of Malawian mine workers uh, to South Africa. Banda, the then president, um, says that Malawian mine workers are not allowed to work on South African mines anymore. And so the mines are forced to find alternative sources of labor. They go to the Transkei, the then Transkei, and employ a lot of black men from the Transkei. Martin Mariotti at the University, uh, Australian National University, then uses the shock to look at the effect of that income increase in the Transkei on um, black men from the Transkei. And she finds that there's a massive increase in height uh, from 1975, 76, 77 compared to 74 and earlier. So this income shock basically from the mines leads to better nutrition um, for children born in 75 and 76. Okay, so I can actually be a very kind of accurate indicator of what happens um, in a specific uh, year. We can then actually also split our sample by different ethnic, ethnic groups, so Tosa, Sutu, and Zulu. Um, you see that basically the biggest shock where the confidence bands are massive, so I wouldn't want to overinterpret this. 
but Situ seemed to be, and again, this fits the story, uh, especially the story of decline. Um, the Basutu economy is ravaged at the start of the 20th century by, by different diseases, there's land dispossession, um, and you find actually <coughs> the, the men that go and work on the mine are predominantly the Situ men who then experience the biggest shock um, as well. Uh, you can obviously compare black and white South Africans over time. <laughs> You see very large confidence bands there for, for whites. So uh, I'm at the moment working on a paper again with these two co-authors, um, well, with, with Martin Mariotti as well, on, um, on the heights of white men. And we can go back even earlier. Uh, but basically, you see uh, large discrepancies already at the start of the 20th century. Um, um, and um, that, those discrepancies being maintained, slightly diverging. Uh, but almost entirely just being, being maintained. Um, and then uh, finally from kind of this section is a very new paper. You are the first to actually see this graph. Um, uh, Igor sent it to me, is Igor here? He sent it to me um, uh, yesterday, so it's, it's very, it's, it's brand new. And this is where we try something more uh, kind of uh, causal. So Hans Jesse, who sits there at the back, had uh, over the last year or two or three transcribed a lot of, of almost all the um, slave emancipation records from 1834, when slaves were emancipated at the Cape. And these records report two amounts. Uh, they report the value of the slaves, and then they report the, the amount that the slave owner received. And this seems to actually vary randomly. We don't. We cannot find a reason. Some some farmers or some slave owners received 70 percent or 80 percent of the value of the slaves, and others received 20 or 30 percent. And this seems to be, it seems to be uncorrelated to anything else. Um, and so we are using this, what we call the kind of random uh, compensation or partial compensation for um, um, for for kind of slaves that were emancipated to look at the effect on longevity, both for the slave owners, but also for their children and for their grandchildren. So the question is, if you receive your full compensation, do you live longer than someone that they receive only half or even nothing? And what we find is actually it does matter. So if you are fully compensated, you are more likely to live longer, the top left one is the first generation, than if you are if you receive only half or even less of your compensation. And the same is true for the second generation, and it also looks to be true for the third generation, although this result is not statistically significant. So um, we think by the third generation, this kind of re this result kind of withers away. So that's kind of a more econometric approach to understanding what were the long-term consequences of um, the, for the slave owners, obviously, specifically of the compensation that they receive. Um, finally, I want to say something about um, uh, the two projects that I'm busy with at the moment uh, that uh, Ingrid had mentioned. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, the Bahorovia and Anchala People Project uh, on the left, top left, and the Cape Panel Project. The Cape Panel is basically um, just a um, a massive project where we transcribe the tax censuses that I've mentioned. So we've, we've used some of these tax censuses, ANSYS um, transcribed them in the 1970s. We are now spending a lot of time, and Chris at the back there is spending all the time in the archives, um, transcribing all the OCA for it. Right, that's the long term plan. So that all of them it takes much longer, it's much more expensive than we naively initially envisaged, but it will happen. The second one is the biography of an uncharted people, and this is where we transcribe again large amounts of historical records like marriage records, um, which includes, I mean, this is on its own, it's not very meaningful that someone's marriage records, uh, record, but if you combine this, if you, co if you put 30,000 of them together, they do tell you really interesting histories. Like, for example, a paper that I'm working on at the moment which is about interracial marriages in Cape Town. So this is the decline in interracial marriages in the 20th century. You'll see actually, on average, in the 1910s, about 7% of all marriages in Cape Town, in the Anglican Church, I should add, were interracial marriages, and that declined significantly over time, and the question I have is why? 
why, what, why uh, does someone enter an interracial marriage and then why does it decline over time? And the kind of preliminary answer so far is that it's part to do, partly to do with segregation. So this is a measure that we developed also from the marriage records where we look at the segregation by parish, uh, by year. And you basically see this increase uh, in segregation, um, meaning that there's this contact with people of a different race. There's obviously a lot more to be done here and uh, other types of explanations, but this seems to be, at least in the regressions, this seems to be significant. You can also, with the marriage records, look at something called the age gap. Um, so the difference between the husband's age, age and the wife's age. Um, and, and this kind of is a good example of where, where the data actually opens a new question instead of just giving you an answer. Um, and I think this actually will happen far more in this project. We'll, we'll, it will just raise new questions more than it actually provides answers. So you'll see the age gap for black uh, uh, marriages are quite high, what you kind of would expect, but then for um, color and for white uh, marriages, it's actually the opposite of what you would expect. So the idea with the age gap is that the, the more affluent you are, the more women typically have, uh, are empowered in the household, they have more bargaining power, and the closer the kind of age gap is. Uh, but yet it's kind of opposite, so um, whites are typically more affluent during this period, but they have a bigger age gap than, than colored marriages. And so this is something worth exploring. Why is it that colored marriages have such a, I mean, um, globally this is a very low number. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing to explore. Why are colored marriages, have, uh, do they have such a small age gap? And my um, kind of initial idea is that it's, uh, if you just look at the, the age at which women get married, there are almost no differences between white and colored women. But if you look at men, the, uh, colored men marry at a much younger age than, um, cut, uh, than uh, white men. So that's something worth exploring. Um, Fran is uh, a postdoc in the history department and he's looking at sex ratios, um, also opening new questions. This is this is an extraordinary no, low number for intersex ratio. Like, anywhere in the world, this is surprising. Um, say 90, 90 men are born for every 100 women. This is weird. Like, we don't understand why, why this is happening. Um, and we have some ideas of why this is. Um, to just give you some taste of how these different projects kind of merge, what I do is I just overlap the heights data on the sex ratio data. Right, you would think that they don't have anything in common with one another, but actually the trend looks pretty similar. So there's a decline in the 1920s, 10s and 20s, and then this kind of increase. And so one theory of the sex ratio is, is that women, female fetuses survive better under conditions of uh, malnourishment. And so more women are born than, uh, than men in really periods of drought or famine, um, and we know that this was a period of the 1910s and the 1920s. And so we can kind of actually use these two types of sources to corroborate each other um, over time. So in conclusion, uh, I want to say this is only the beginning. There's a lot more to be, to be done. We want to transcribe faster. I see some statisticians and computer scientists also here. We need the collaboration of people with the ability to help us transcribe faster. So OCR techniques, um, that's a whole com you know, completely novel in the field. Um, especially the OCR, not only of type material, but of handwritten material. But, but this is like really, I think, um, it feels to me like we can build self-driving cars, so we must be able for computers to read the handwriting, but it's, really, it's not that easy. Um, there's a lot of unexplored archives in South Africa and in the rest of Africa um, that offer huge opportunities for more transcription, more of these kinds of work. Um, and I think there's many questions still to be asked, right? So it's not only about answering these questions, but it's about posing kind of new questions. I want to end with saying that there is, if we, there is the possibility that there will be a bigger cleavage between what is happening in history departments um, and generally in history, in South Africa and in Africa and with what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, a lot of my colleagues in Europe and America are adopting these techniques and writing really fascinating um, uh, research. And they are also very keen to work on Africa and South Africa. 
Um, and it's, um, there is a chance that if we don't allow our students or encourage our students even to adopt some of these uh, or to, to equip themselves with some of these uh, methods and techniques, then they will be left behind. Um, so I, it really is a, uh, I want to motivate for, for greater diversity in the teaching of methods um, from the digital humanities and statistics in the, in specifically in the, in the humanities departments. Um, and then I think from economists and, uh, and statisticians, uh, there are immense uh, benefits for us in interdisciplinary research. A lot of the questions that we've asked actually wouldn't have been posed had we not had that interaction with the historians, um, sociologists, political scientists. So, so greater interdisciplinary research is vital. Finally, I want to just uh, say that this again is a group effort. There are many uh, of uh, of you that are part of LEAP um, and there's always an open invitation for more of you to join. Uh, my department has been in, in economics has been incredibly supportive of what we've been doing. We've received um, a lot of funding as we've alluded to uh, before. Um, so thanks for that. For many of you who have to sit through all of these funding applications, um, I really appreciate uh, that. And then if you want to find out more, you can, you can um, uh, visit our website and, uh, or just send me an email. That's it. Thanks.